we get angry when it's like, that is wrong. I am, that is an amoral decision that you have made BMW. And I think that's how people reacted to this story is it's like, it's amoral. So Zach, we connected, sheesh, it's gotta be a month and a half ago or so around BMW. BMW mm -hmm. offered a heated seat subscription and there was a massive push back online and everybody was, uh, the meme warriors came out, uh, it was, you know, you've already bought the car. It has the capability for heated seats and BMW said, Hey, you want to turn those on? Fine. Pay. Um, talk about how you felt when you saw that story. Yeah, I think so. This idea of essentially like how you pay for things when you move from a world where physical products are fully owned versus partially owned, right? Which I do think, you know, as things become more connected, there's more IOT stuff behind the scenes, like the ownership idea gets really convoluted, um, has, I think a bunch of moral consequences, um, which is that, and I think this is where these topics get really interesting. People get really angry and it's an, it's a level of anger that goes far beyond just like I would or would not be willing to pay that amount for that feature, right? Like we don't get angry about this stuff. We get angry when it's like, that is wrong. I am, that is an amoral decision that you have made BMW. And I think that's how people reacted to this story is it's like, it's amoral. And so what is that? Like, where does that feeling come from? I think it like ties to ownership. It ties to that idea that you said of like, I understand, I don't have to be an engineer to know that like there is a heater in there. And if you're willing to, if you're willing to like rent me the capability, I know the heater is in there. Like no one's coming to install it when I pay the fee. Right. So like that makes me mad because it's my car and it's got the capability in it and it feels wrong to charge me for something that I own. You know, what's really interesting about that. I drive a model Y. And mm -hmm. it's the dual motor long range, not the performance model, but you can buy acceleration boost. I think it's like $2,400, $2,600, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Uh, you can also pay $400 more to, I think there's a hardware component here as well, to have a digital garage opener attached basically. So from your screen, you can do that. Nobody mm -hmm. whines and complains about Tesla not allowing acceleration boost to come through. Right. Nobody yeah. whines and complains. You know what? Full self-driving is now $15,000 in the States. It's like almost $20,000 in Canada. Nobody yeah. really complains about that. Why is that? I think that... Um... I'll tell you, I have a theory, but I will say like, I think this is actually really complicated in terms of our perception of value. Um, yes. And I guess let's start there. We perceive that value is delivered to us in these products in very particular ways. And that perception is tied to our understanding of how things are made and how things are built. Um, and when we know how things are built, it leads to us having an opinion on how those things are paid for. When we don't know how things are built, then it gives the builder a little bit of flexibility in terms of being able to charge for something. Um, uh, and also when we have incorrect assumptions about how something works, I think it, uh, it limits what the builder can do. So let me, let me give a couple of examples, a heater, like, you don't, like I said, you don't have to be an engineer, right? There is a thing yep. that gets warm under the chair, right? And like, how does that work? It doesn't matter, right? Like, you know, it's there and it costs some amount of money for BMW to put it in there. So the right way to charge for it is like that costs you X dollars to put in there. You're going to charge me Y dollars. I assume that Y is greater than X. You're going to make some profit and that's fine, mm -hmm. right? But that's like the right mm -hmm. way to do it. Um, and that's because I have an understanding of how that thing is built. Now take a different example where this is where I would say we, we have a sort of incorrect understanding of how things work, which is um, modern cameras and smartphones. So cameras have gotten a zillion times better over the last decade. Um, a lot of those advancements are actual physical improvements to the lens, to the sensor, but a lot of them are also in software algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. Like there is a better algorithm now that takes the same information and produces a better image at the end of the day. Now, mm -hmm. I think that if you are technical and you like get into this kind of stuff, then you like might know that, but most everyday people don't understand, I think, that like the algorithm is a big part of that. And so let's say that Apple said, as an example, um, that there's two versions of this phone, right? Um, they're the same hardware, 
but one of them has the fancy algorithms that give you the better image and one of them doesn't. So it's like good image, great image. And the great image is going to cost you $50 more than the good image. How would people feel about that? I think people would be pissed, right? Yes, they would. And I think the reason is because they're, even though it is actual software value, um, they're perceiving that it's a hardware capability and they don't like paying for a sort of hardware difference in an, uh, now the, I think the example of the, um, the model Y, what's the, what's the feature that you, that you can pay for performance boost, performance boost. I think, um, actually gets into the zone where it's, we don't actually understand how it works. And so we're willing to take a little <laughs> bit of nothing from the manufacturer, which is like, why is it that the car can go faster when you do that? Well, and I will say like, I, I, I'll start by saying like, I actually don't know how this works. Right. So the Thank two of us, it's my guess is at the end of the day, there is something they're doing in software to be able to get more power out of the battery and pass that into the motor on a shorter time frame that gets you more power. Like this is mm -hmm. like, we have a bunch of like Dyson stuff in our house, right? This is like Dyson's magic is the, like <laughs> their ability to like maintain power levels out of a battery is really good, but that's all like software stuff that they're doing within the, um, within those, the, the circuitry, um, and the embedded systems that are in there. So now I think what allows them to get away with charging that as a premium is that we don't actually know how it works, mm -hmm. but, but we're willing to believe that it's a software-ish kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think people are willing to pay for software add-ons, right? Like you've begun trained on this. The app store is just like a bunch of software add-ons. And so the, the idea that you pay for a software enhancement after the fact is acceptable to us as long as we perceive that it's software or that we don't know. And if you tell us, I think that this is also Tesla markets this way. So they'll say it's a software feature and because we don't know any better. We're like, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, sure. It's fine. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you did that with, again, coming back to the phone, I think if you said this was a software feature that makes it good, people would be like, that's not how cameras work. But, well, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Computational photography. It's interesting that you mentioned this because kind of the origin story behind Particle was in a sense, a software feature and upgrade to a piece of hardware, right? You programmed remotely a light to flash, if I, if I remember the story correctly. So your dad yep. would know when you text him because he was, he was deaf or hard of hearing and he couldn't yep. hear the little beep. Is that correct? Yep. That's correct. Yeah. Good memory. So yeah, I, and it's funny because, you know, this product never came to be, right? This was the early idea that we pivoted away from and eventually became a platform. Um, but it's, an, you know, it's interesting where you're going with this because the idea that I had for that product was that it's a product with APIs and it's a product with apps. Right. So the way that we presented this initial lighting product was like, you're going to buy light and that light is going to have apps. And my, I'll, like, this is not laid out in like the Kickstarter campaign in much detail, which is where you're going to buy those apps for the apps do, right? Like the Kickstarter campaign describes the basic functionality of a connect to the light, which is like, okay, what do you need? You need to be able to turn it on and off from your phone. You need to be able to do scheduling. You need to be able to do scenes mm -hmm. and things like that. That's the basic requirement. So the connect to the light that's built in, you get that with the light. And then something like a notifications app would be an app. Not, this is not described in the Kickstarter campaign. It says it could use apps, right? Well, like, mm -hmm. okay, what, how would those be purchased? Right. I actually had not really worked this out, but my expectation was that those apps are not going to come from the manufacturer, right? Which I guess was, was us, right? So mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. expectation was we were going to sell you the product and that other people were going to have apps and they were going to sell you the apps. Mm -hmm. And that also creates a separation where, so let's say somebody builds the notifications app on top of this thing that allows somebody to flash the lights when something happens, like, a, like they get a text message. Is that isn't us, then I think coming back to like the morals and what's right or wrong, I expect that somebody's going to be willing to pay mm -hmm. that app developer mm -hmm. for the app, right? Um, and th therefore they're okay paying like that sort of app add-on fee on top of the initial hardware purchase. Yeah, and it's pretty interesting, hey, because you have layers of capability and add-ons and actually layers of delivering that functionality as well. 
This is this area is fascinating to me for a lot of different reasons. I mean, you had a lot of conspiracy theorists over the past couple of years uh, quoting somebody from the World Economic Forum. You will own nothing and you will be happy. <laughs> and, and, and looking at that as, you know, that's that's the goal there. That's the goal there. But there are areas where I'm happy to do that. And music is one. So uh -huh. I subscribe to Apple Music and and I'm happy to rent my music there. It sucks in some ways because. Right. It's a qualitatively worse experience in some ways than buying a piece of plastic and owning it or buying a song because right. songs will go missing. They're just mm -hmm. not authorized to play it anymore. Or the favorite song that you love will suddenly change. And guess mm -hmm. what? The artist wasn't getting paid for that. And here's a version that they are getting paid for. So they're substituting. So that sucks in some way. But as the utility is still good enough, great enough, access to 15 million, 25 million, whatever the number is, songs. I don't have to right. think about it ever that I, I make that call. But I'm sure there's some places where I wouldn't make that call. I don't think I would make that call with a car. I don't mm -hmm. know. Where's your line? I think I, well... I think the line will move for all of us over time, but which is to say, if I go back to that idea of like the world economic forum, like you're never, you're not going to own anything. I think if we actually, let's maybe use software as an example of this, right? Cause this has yep. already happened in software. Once upon a time, um, we, the way that you got software was you bought a CD or a floppy disk or whatever, and it came with that software on it and you put it in your computer and you loaded it up. Now that feels like ownership. But ownership's complicated. Like, in fact, you didn't really right. own it, <laughs> right? You didn't yes. own it. Um, yep. You had a license to it. And even I think music and media are kind of that way too, which is like when you buy a, when you buy a record, mm -hmm. there is a certain level of ownership that you have over that thing. Like you own the record, mm -hmm. but you don't own the music. The music is, you have a mm -hmm. license to use that music. If you play that song in a particular kind of environment, you have to pay a licensing fee, right? Yes. Like if yeah. you took that record that you own and you played it in a venue with 50,000 people there, right? Like you don't necessarily get to do that for free. Um, yeah. And so the reality is that ownership's always been complicated. It's just that it's not been quite so like, uh, so visible in how it's complicated. And SaaS, I think is a good example of in the early days of SaaS, which is like Salesforce, right? Inventing the concept. They use this as a value proposition to say, look, the thing is about licensed software is that like you never really owned it anyway, and you're just paying on an annual fee to have somebody come maintain this stuff, right? Like when you have an Oracle license, like you're, you don't actually own that Oracle software. And so let's just accept that and actually move to a model that embraces that and uses it to create a better product. And when you move to SaaS, here's why SaaS is better than licensed software. Our product gets better every day. And that is, that was Salesforce's like no software thing, right? And now that's been embraced by all enterprise software such that like these days, enterprise software is just sold that way. And it's not even, mm -hmm. you don't even mm -hmm. question that, right? If somebody sold license mm -hmm. software, you think that was weird. And, but it starts with all of those SaaS products improve consistently over time. That's the expectation the customers now have. So if we now apply this to physical products. I think that, um, the ownership model will change. And my expectation is that over time, we do move to a model where more and more of the stuff that we own is not in fact owned, but is paid for as a service. I don't think this will ever happen to cheap stuff. Like there's, you know, like mm -hmm. a toaster. It's just, it's not that expensive. And so we're not going to get- 10 to cents to get toast today. <laughs> <laughs> not going to happen, right? <laughs> but like, you know, your- um, a good example of something kind of expensive in your house would be like, okay, um, uh, like let's say you live in a place with not great electricity and you have a generator. Like mm -hmm. that's a really good example of a thing that like, yeah, kind of makes sense that you could move to a world where that starts to become rented. And solar. So the solar is often sold that way. It's sold right. that way. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so, and, but I think it has to come with real value to the consumer for people to not be upset about it, which is if you say this is now you're going to pay this a monthly fee instead of owning it, but here's what, but it's going to get better all the time, or we're going to provide a better service. We're going to guarantee it always works. Right. Um, now I think when you create that value, then I think that that makes it, uh, a that makes it feel like a good choice for the consumer. 
And I do expect there will always be the like, just like in um, music, while streaming services are are becoming increasingly the standard way that people will consume music, vinyl's back in, right? Yeah. I do think there will always be the counterculture, which is mm -hmm. as you move more towards as a service subscription models, then people are going to be like, nah, right to repair. Here's something mm -hmm. that linked the, um, I'm not blinking the laptop that has become, uh, uh, the sort of new modular laptop that is, that has made it possible that it's shown that you can in fact have like swappable components. And yes, I saw that actually, yeah, last week. And that's like, you know, that's the counterculture, the opportunity for somebody to come in and sell against that general direction towards subscriptions and, uh, things of that nature. It's really interesting, actually, because something that Apple has been rumored to be working on and be releasing at some point is a subscription service for your phone, basically, mm -hmm. right? You you have it for almost everything else. And, right. you know, you pay a certain amount and they ship you a new phone every year or every right. two years, maybe depending on your level, whatever the case might be. And Samsung right. can do that. Anybody can do that. Google can do that as well uh, with Pixel phones or something like that. Pretty interesting, but there is a risk, right? Because like one of the things, we live in the real world. We live in a world with complex geopolitics. Mm -hmm. We live in a world in which uh, Russia, Russia's president has threatened using nukes if it's not allowed to keep the parts of Ukraine that it's taken. And one of the responses that I have read about that could be considered if they do is U.S. government could force Apple and Google to say, hey, break those phones, <laughs> right? break those phones. Right. It's an interesting possibility. Right. But I think what's what's. What's interesting about that is that. How long has it been true that Apple could just break your phone? Right. Probably at the beginning. Right. Like it, that's, in, it, it's, it's 2022. The iPhone was launched in 2007. I should, would be curious to know like, oh, interesting. How far would you have to go back before Apple could do it? But like, it, it might not be since the beginning. It's probably pretty close. Right. Yes. So like really this whole time. And that I think is the key here is like things are being increasingly, um, the things that we use are increasingly reliant on companies that are going to provide ongoing service. And that's true, whether it's an IOT thing mm -hmm. or it's true, whether it's, you know, I mean, like a good example would be just like construction equipment, right? Like if you buy a Caterpillar, yep. uh, um, a piece of construction equipment, well, you gotta buy it. Like you're going to break apart and mm -hmm. Caterpillar's got to be there to provide that part, right? Um, they have to still be making those parts, but there have to be enough of them out there that you can use them. So you are relying on that company's continued existence and to provide those parts, if Caterpillar sanctioned uh, the, well, this is actually interesting now because then you imagine, well, let's say that the U.S. government said you can't sell those things to Russia anymore. What would they do with their construction equipment? Well, they would uh, probably weld, like they'd, they'd weld probably the in replacement parts. If so that's why could, I think it's interesting, right? Is like yep. whether or not you can repair it on your own right to repair legislation gets really interesting here. That exact scenario you just described is happening right now with jets that Russia mm. has in its property right now. Uh, and of course, it's been going on for years with John Deere equipment where farmers have been advocating for right to repair. Yep. So it is an interesting world that we are creating. Um, and, you know, just imagine the hack that somebody could hack in, have access to Apple servers and convince Apple that every single iPhone has been stolen. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> that breaks every iPhone in existence. Well, I, there's I think the, the, there. The, the Go ahead. Business models around this stuff, it's a lot like privacy security issues, right? Which, you know, cover like all the same topics, right? There's like a lot of moral complexity uh, around how companies deliver product and services here. And I think at the end of the day, there are opportunities for companies to stay ahead of the game on right to repair, on ownership models, on privacy, on, on, on security. But generally speaking, the thing that trumps everything else is is your product better than the next guy's product, right? Like yep. if you make yep. a better product or service, something that actually meets the need, com com people will generally bend a little bit on their requirements and expectations of all those other things in order to get that thing. And that's where like BMW coming back to the original model, that's where they failed, right? It's like, yeah, you couldn't like maybe compel somebody to pay a subscription for something in a car, but like, you know, they're not gonna do it for the heated car seat that's been in the car <laughs> for, de for decades, right? Yes. Like, 
you have not earned the opportunity to charge me in these new and interesting ways. I, I like what you're saying there. And I think the other component of it is uh, law, essentially, yeah. because we've evolved very strong law, whether it's good or bad, around physical ownership of things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Inadvertent uh, transfer of ownership, <laughs> we could put it that way. We've got, we got laws around that. We have, we, we have penalties around that. We have jails for that. Mm -hmm. We have not really updated those property laws and it's property in quotation marks, as we mentioned earlier on this very call, for when you have, are paying for access to a service. There has been in Europe some pushback against EULAs, right? And user license agreements that you sign or um, check a box or don't even check mm -hmm. a box, you open a package, right? But we probably need some level of those around consumer rights so that we solve some of these issues on the back end as well. Anyways, yeah. it's a brave new world that we're entering. Uh, any last thoughts? You know, just on that point, I, I, I agree because I do think like you know, right to right to repair legislation is, I think, is good for all of us, right? And it has to be mm -hmm. written right. It has to be written in a way that actually leads to the right outcomes. And this stuff can be challenging because, you know, it, uh, the wrong regulation can can create more problems. Than, yes. Than it, yeah. uh, um, and then it starts. But, you know, with these examples, for instance, you know, I, I think about an IoT, how a lot of it, it's not that uncommon for IoT manufacturers to go out of business and leave all their devices bricked, right? Like, mm -hmm. how could, mm -hmm. how could, you know, regulators, government entities, address those problems. Well, um, you know, uh, it's tough to say that a company is required to provide ongoing service forever because literally the company goes out of business, right? Yes. Um, but you can imagine <laughs> saying, well, a company is required to, if they go out of business and can no longer, then they have to do something to deliver the source code to customers. So like a good example, this is what Pebble um, was, was acquired by Fitbit. Um, and they released Rebel, these open source software, and basically said like, hey, look, we're gone. And that does mean these watches are going to stop. But Here's a bit of software that you all have control over. Goodbye. <laughs> yes. And like, yes. Those watches still work. And I think that that is inspiring and it is something that more companies could do. And unfortunately, I, I know Eric, the founder uh, of Pebble and a lot of the early employees there, and like they cared a lot that that mm -hmm. watch still worked. I think Eric might have done it just so that his watch still, he still wears <laughs> one. And he... those people swear by it. They swear <laughs> by it. They still wear those yeah. pebbles. But that is something that more companies could do and maybe with the right pressure, which could come from regulation to say like, look, you kind of got to set it yourself up this way such that if you blink out of existence, that your stuff keeps working, you have to be able to release the software to make it still, you know, to, to allow mm -hmm. people to take control in, a, in an environment where you're no longer able to provide that service. And this is a very real issue that is ongoing all the time. Uh, Google just exited Stadia um, or Stadia, mm -hmm. I don't know how you say it, Stadia, Stadia, which is their cloud gaming <laughs> service. Yep. And people swear by the controller for this gaming service. They love this controller. It's great. feels mm -hmm. good. Works well. All that stuff. It will be useless the second Stadia or Stadia is gone. Yep. Uh, and they're asking Google for a small firmware upgrade. Right. They can use it as a Bluetooth controller on other devices. So we'll see if right. that happens. Uh, there's a petition going around right now, I believe. And we'll see if that goes on. But it's a real issue. It. Perfect example, right? Which is like, yes, of course, just release the firmware update. Like, just put in a little bit of effort to make this less terrible for the people who are negatively affected. Exactly. Zach, thank you so much for taking this time. Absolutely. It was great. <laughs> <laughs>